listening to Paris Search UK Radio. News, views and reviews from the world of the paranormal from across the UK and beyond. Find us on Facebook, Twitter and the World Wide Web. Paris Search UK Radio. Views and opinions expressed by presenters and guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Parasearch UK Radio or its affiliates and sponsors. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to Haunted Histories with your host, Penny G. Morgan, right here on Parasearch UK Radio. Good evening and welcome back to Haunted Histories on Parasearch UK Radio with me, your haunted hostess with hopefully the mostess, Penny G. Morgan. Firstly, I'd like to say a big, big thank you to everyone who has been listening to the shows so far. This is my fifth show and it's a bit of a special one as not only are we going to be time travelling, we're also going to be travelling, travelling because we're going across the pond this week to the United States and in the second half we're going to be joined by my very special guest Mr Christopher St Booth to hear about his experiences of the place that we're going to be discussing. So as I think I said last week and probably the week before if you have anything to add to today's show or previous shows that it's from your personal experience I would love to hear from you, so please feel free to contact us using any of our sites, our Facebook, Parasearch site, our webpage, Twitter, YouTube, whichever social media you wish to use, I would love to hear from you. Some of the places um, I'm going to be looking at in the next month or so are Taunton Castle, Ripon Workhouse, the Ragged School in London and Mary King's Close in Edinburgh. So if you do have any stories to tell about those places, let us know and you might hear it across the airwaves or the internet but I think you know what I mean (laughs) so where are we visiting today well recently more recently it became known as the stay on the main but that was quite a recent change because before that it was called the Cecil Hotel now some of you may or may not have heard of it but by the end of the show you'll understand why I think it warranted a show in its own right The hotel itself was built in 1924 and had around 700 rooms over 15 floors. It was in a built in a part of Los Angeles that catered for seasonal workers coming in and was actually what they call a residential hotel which meant people actually lived there, it wasn't necessarily one you just stayed in for a week whilst on holiday. Um, In fact, uh, from my understanding, and my special guest Christopher should be able to confirm this, there's probably still people living there now. Um, But unfortunately, its reputation, especially in California and places like that, now probably precede it as a place of foreboding and malevolence due to the various episodes of, should we say, darkness that have happened there. It wasn't the only hotel built in this area, sort of from the late 1800s to the mid 1920s, but it's probably one of the most infamous now. I'm sure, well I know, we'll be discussing this more with uh, Christopher, but the most recent case that, if you like, hit the headlines for the Cecil was that of um, poor Eliza Lamb in 2013. She was a Chinese-Canadian who was backpacking around the US and disappeared while staying at the Cecil. Without going into too much detail at this stage, she was found in one of the massive water tanks on the roof of the hotel. But gruesomely, the only reason she was found was because some guests had complained about the water tasting funny and the pressure being off. In a, what some might say, a typical American reaction, the hotel was subsequently sued by some of the guests for breach of contract as, in inverted commas, the defendants provided water that had been contaminated by human remains and was not fit for human ingestion or to use to wash. The case itself was actually dismissed eventually, Um, but if I'm honest, I do find it a bit astounding that a potential class action was brought on this matter. 
Um, well, maybe not astounded, as I probably would be quite upset to find out I'd been drinking and showering in the water, possibly of a dead and decaying poor individual. But I would have struggled to apportion blame on the hotel itself, unless they were complicit in what happened to poor Eliza. Anyway, Eliza did have mental health problems. Um, she was diagnosed as being suffering with bipolar and suffered with depression and was on medication for these. The main piece of evidence that people interested in the story are focused on is the elevator footage. You can view this online if you look for it. Please do. Let us know if you think it shows her acting erratically, as if someone's following her. But the most intriguing bit is that the footage seems to perhaps jump, indicating that parts may have been taken out. This is something I will be discussing with Christopher, as his background in film, um, as he has a background, sorry, in film, he probably will be able to offer some useful insights to that. But why would this particular hotel possibly be possessed, or have some kind of malevolence within it? Well, apart from the fact that it has been home to two well-known serial killers, Richard Ramirez, also known as the Night Stalker, he stayed there in 1985 and he was arrested in the August of that actual year and charged, I think it was with the murder of about 13 people. He was actually given the death sentence but he died of lymphoma in 2013 whilst awaiting execution. If you read his backstory, he was very close to his older cousin by all accounts who had served in Vietnam and his older cousin took great delight in telling the adolescent young boy his tales of raping Vietnamese women and I believe he used to show him the photos of it as well. R Richard was also present when he watched his cousin shoot his wife in the face. After that he went to live with his sister, whose husband was a peeping Tom and took Richard out on his nocturnal exploits with him. Not condoning what Ramirez did in any way, shape or form, but with an upbringing like that he was never going to have normal inclinations or perhaps normal mentality but reading the reports of the people who actually apprehended him, which I believe um, they caught him trying to carjack jack a car, um, they said that looking in his eyes he just looked pure evil. Jack Untwinger, Untwega, sorry, also stayed there in 1991. Whilst he is less well known, he was an Austrian national who served time in prison between 1974 and 1990 for murder, and on release, he basically started killing again straight away, including, it is believed, three prostitutes in his room at the Hatchell Hotel, the Cecil. Although he didn't confine his killings to the US alone, but he also m murdered in Germany, Austria, and what is now the Czech Republic. He actually committed suicide by hanging in his cell in 1992 after his arrest, and he had killed at least 10, possibly 12, during that short spree. And like I say, three of those were prostitutes believed to have been murdered in his room at the Cecil. Ramirez isn't believed to have killed anyone at the Cecil, however it is believed that he used to dump some of his um, bloody clothes and some of the um, things he took from his victims in the skips out the back of the hotel, so there could have been energy attaching to those I guess. Back in 1947, if we go back a little bit, little bit further, the brutal murder of Elizabeth Short, known as the Black Dahlia, shocked society. And for those who haven't heard of her, she was a Hollywood wannabe, a beautiful young brunette who was found, and I say this is explicit, sliced in two, totally exsanguinated, her intestines placed under her and her face slashed from side to side, creating an effect known as a Glasgow smile. Why am I mentioning this gruesome case? Well, apart from the fact it has never been solved, so it is an intriguing one, she is reputed to have drunk in the Cecil, close to when she would have disappeared, possibly on that night. Many historians and people who research this area thoroughly dispute this being her reputed haunt, if you pardon the pun, um, saying that her place of choice was actually somewhere called the Biltmore Hotel. The Biltmore is so proud of this fact that I found out that you can actually buy a cocktail there called the Black Dahlia. But it is another name that is associated with the Cecil. There have been many, many suicides at the hotel over the period it's been open. One of the most horrifying, in my view, was that of 19-year-old Dorothy Purcell in 1944, who actually gave birth in her room, not wanting to wake her much older partner up, I believe he was in his late 30s, 
and thinking that the baby was actually stillborn, she threw it out of the window. She was found eventually not guilty by way of insanity, although some jurors did actually want to put her up for the death penalty for what she did to her baby. However, she ended up being found to be mentally mentally ill and insane. Another case that sticks out was that of Pauline Otten, who jumped from the hotel after a reportedly vicious row with her husband in 1962. She actually landed on a passing pedestrian and killed both of them immediately. That that's You don't expect that to happen, do you? In 1964, a local woman who was renowned, renowned for feeding the birds, her nickname being Pigeon, Goldie Osgood, was found in her ransacked room after being stabbed, strangled and raped. A man was arrested for the crime after being spotted walking along the street covered in blood, but he was released quite soon after and no one has ever been charged for her murder, either. But why would a beautiful Art Deco inspired hotel have fallen down on its luck so much that not only did it become better known for its cases of suicide and murder within its walls, but it was also the inspiration for American Horror Stories Hotel series. Brad Falchuk and Ryan Murphy have stated that it's definitely one of the places they drew from when creating the Hotel Cortez. And if you look at pictures of the Cecil and compare them with the shots from the Cortez, from the outside, etc., etc., you can definitely see a parallel. Although, I don't actually think Rudolf Valentino and Natasha Rambova are actually bricked up in the walls. But I do have to admit that any hotel that had Kathy Bates as a receptionist and Matt Bomer living there would be fine by me and I'd be renting a room very quickly. And if you don't know to what I'm re- referring, go and catch up with American Horror Story Hotel on Netflix or wherever it is you can download it from and you'll see what I mean. But I think we have to go much, much further back back to the Roaring Twenties to find out why this, what is actually in my view a quite an impressive building would probably be hailed and a, a one that would probably be hailed as, as something significant and of, and of historical value if situated somewhere else has had such a turnaround of fortune to that I want to take us back to the period in history we're going to be looking at tonight and that's the Great Depression now only five years after the um, the Cecil actually opened America was plunged into the Great Depression the biggest downturn the world had ever seen and one would, which would last for ten years now the Great Depression didn't actually affect many other countries it, it, it affected them sorry but not to the extent it affected America um, but it's not surprising really that the boom of the Roaring Twenties was followed by a bust of the 1930s. Any economist will tell you booms tend to be followed by busts. What goes up must come down. But on October the 24th, 1929, which became known as Black Thursday, something in the region of 12.9 million shares were traded by panicked investors. This was followed five days later on Black Tuesday by a further 16 million shares flooding into the market. Now, without giving you um, an economics lesson or a lesson on shares and all of that kind of thing, this flood of equities onto the market left them practically valueless and meant that those people who had taken out credit to invest were left heavily in debt. Bear in mind, during the 1920s, credit was something that was starting to be seen an awful lot more often. Um, Leveraging to invest, which means taking out a loan to invest, was seen as a lot more often. And I believe, and I'm not sure if this is true, but I remember being told once that Henry Ford was one of the first to start credit to buy a car to sell more of his new Ford cars. So those people would have been left heavily, heavily in debt. They wouldn't have just lost their savings. They would be heavily in debt and still having to pay off those loans. But it's not so much the money side that we can see the impact on, but the social side, the people themselves. The effect of this depression was massive. Banks were failing left, right and centre. The statistics say over 50% of banks actually failed during that period, which meant people who had been prudent had lost their savings. By 1933, around 15 million Americans were unemployed. 
15 million and this compares three years earlier in 1933 to around 4 million. It's an astonishing figure. In 1933 the average family income had dropped to um, $1,500 which was 40% less than the 1929 average family income of $2,300. As I say, millions of families lost their savings as numerous banks started collapsing in the 1930s. Remember, 50% of banks failed. Unable to make mortgage or rent payments, many were deprived of their homes or were evicted from their apartments. Both working class and middle class families were drastically affected by the depression. It hit different classes. It wasn't just one class alone. Now, many of us have probably seen the film Annie. Um, Yes, I know it's not paranormal and it's not a true story. But her actual situation and the setup of the orphanage was not unusual during this period. There was a reported 50% increase of children entering custodial care from 1929 to 1931. So, scarily enough, there were probably many Miss Hannigans around that time, although probably not enough Daddy Warbucks to uh, rescue children from the orphanages. But more children were left on orphanage steps, which is some of the storyline in Annie, that children were just left on the steps with notes saying, please look after me. Although um, divorce rates also declined, This seems to have been largely the consequence, actually, of not being able to pay a lawyer's fees. Desertion rates increased also during the decade. In some cases, two or more families crowded together in apartments or homes designed for single-family residences. You also had around, they reckon, around a quarter of a million younger people, they call them youths, but it could be anything from 12 upwards, were on the road travelling by freight train or hitchhiking in order to find work or just more favourable circumstances for them to live in. The traditional roles in the family changed. The male head of the household was no longer the breadwinner in many cases, leaving the money earning to the wives and children. Many men couldn't cope with this change in status and rather than just stick it out, they walked out on their families, possibly due to um, actual depression. They couldn't cope. A 1940 survey Um, which I read, the source of which I can't actually find, unfortunately, otherwise I could quantify it, reported that in the period of the Great Depression, some 1.5 million women had been deserted by their husbands. Now, granted, some of those might have got divorced in other circumstances when there was the money to pay for lawyers, but 1.5 million women were left by their husbands. Children were no longer able to just be children. They were having to help contribute to the household, many suffering with malnutrition and heart co- health complaints due to the actual lack of affordable health care available. Birth rates fell to an all- all-time low. Those children were all too aware of the precarious nature of their existence, never knowing where their next meal would come from or even if they would have a roof over their head. They didn't get things like Christmas and birthday presents, many of them. You look at any of the photos from that period and you can see them in um, sort of worn out clothes and, and looking looking very, very sad. Uh, but how does this all apply to the Cecil and Why? Well, the Cecil Hotel was built in an area that became known as Skid Row shortly after the Depression began in 1924. And this is Skid Row the area, not the 1980s American rock band who uh, had their youth go wild 30 years or so ago. According to other statistics I've found as I've been looking for them, Skid Row, or that area of LA, is now it now has one of the largest and most stable homeless communities. But in, in the 1930s, it's believed that the area was home to as many as 10,000 homeless and transient individuals, and the once decadent Cecil became a home to many of these, as did the other hotels in the area built around the same time for the same reason, to cater for those seasonal workers who came into the area and might need short-term residential. 
You also have to factor in that the suicide rate during the 10-year period of the Great Depression was the highest it had ever been. In one year alone, 23,000 people are reported to have committed suicide and succeeded. The reported average rates increasing from 12 people per 100,000 in 1928 to 19 per 100,000 just a year later in 1929. But why, why, why am I telling you this? Well, it may go some way to explain the six reported suicides at the Cecil from 1931 to 1939. Whilst when we talk to Christopher after the break, we will most certainly debate whether the Cecil does have some darkness surrounding it. It's worth keeping in mind as well that during the Great Depression itself, the kind of people who would have been going there and staying in the area would have not only been potentially on the fringe of society, but probably incredibly down on their luck, and more likely to decide enough is enough. Maybe they're at the end of their journey, um, and that was the only place they found that they could exist in, but they didn't want to go on any more. In another strange twist involved with the Cecil and its surrounding area, remember I told you about the sad case of Eliza Lamb? I mentioned it at the beginning, the poor young girl who was found uh, drowned in the water tank. Well, as I also said, the area is heavily populated with the homeless. And in 2013, the same year that poor Eliza died, the homeless community were facing a tuberculosis epidemic, something that can be quite common with the homeless because of the proximity to which they live and the lack of health care which they'd, they'd be able to receive. And the name of the test they used to determine the strain of tuberculosis, believe it or not, was called the Lamalisa. So is there a correlation between tuberculosis and the outbreak that they were facing in this part of Los Angeles and Eliza's death. Well, I know conspiracy theorists would be speculating on Eliza being possibly used as a guinea pig for some new drug and the side effects having caused her to climb onto an alarmed floor and drown in a massive water tank. Personally, personally, I just think it is a very, very, very weird a sad and very strange coincidence but I will concede it's a very very strange coincidence not just a little bit strange the fact that around the same time that this test was developed a woman by that name also died in mysterious circumstances there have been um, many amateur sleuths trying to solve the sad case of Eliza not least the added parallel between what happened to the poor girl and the plotline of a film called Dark Water, which was released eight years before her death in 2005. This had two characters in it, strangely enough, called Dahlia and Cecilia, who had an experience with a water tank. I haven't seen it, so I can't comment as whether there's any spooky links to the Lamb case, but with the Hotel Cecil's, links to potential links sorry to the black dahlia there is certainly a coincidence there but it does depend on whether you think coincidences are just that or if there's something deeper to it as i say we'll be discussing all of these things and more with christopher after the break and we'll get his take on it because i genuinely i don't know I don't know if it is just coincidence, if the place is um, evil, or if everything can be explained away with rational, objective argument. All I know is it's very sad, the amount of people whose lives have been lost in this building, um, and the fact a 21-year-old girl is now used almost as, a, as an example of conspiracy and everything else, I think is very sad and unfortunate. And I feel for her family. But whether there's any paranormal links to all these things that have happened, I don't know. Tell you what, let's take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll be talking with Christopher and we'll get his take on it and see what he thinks. You're listening.
are listening to Paris Search UK Radio. News, views and reviews from the world of the paranormal from across the UK and beyond. Find us on Facebook, Twitter and the World Wide Web. Paris Search UK Radio. So we're back. I hope you're all ready and raring to go for the second half of this show on the Cecil Hotel in Los Angeles. I am genuinely delighted to be joined by Mr. Christopher St. Booth. Christopher, tell us about yourself. For example, how did you get into the paranormal? Oh, well, hello, um, everybody. Um, it's, a, it's a very, uh, not really a long story. I mean, we've basically been in the entertainment business for a long time. So about um, around 2003, um, we had been in the movie business for a while, but we went down to make a movie in... Uh, uh, an American town called Kentucky, <laughs> and it's Louisville, Kentucky. You know, I gotta like the way you say Kentucky, and um, it's a beautiful town with beautiful people. And when we went there, uh, we went there to shoot a horror movie for Sony Pictures, which turned out to be Death Tunnel, which mm -hmm. is available in England and um, available worldwide, actually. And it did that, really well. Get, we get that on the is it the on OD Spooked TV? OD was that the website you sent me? Yes. Yeah. yeah. You can well, you can see some of our movies there, and then you can um, obviously buy some at SpookTV.com. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, because Sony owns Death Tunnel, I think you probably would look up your digital content provider, whoever okay. it may be, and just type in the title, and it would come up. Mm -hmm. But it's a great movie, and it's about uh, a real sanitarium, mm -hmm. a sanatorium, not sanitarium. Big difference there, actually. <laughs> a sanatorium um, in Waverly Hills. Uh, uh, um, it was called Waverly Hills and we went down there to shoot a movie and while we were shooting it um, it was about you know what happened there which you know a lot of people died mm -hmm. of tuberculosis in the early 1900s while we were filming this stuff started to really happen so we I said we got to bring a film crew in to film us filming this because it's you know not just filming our horror movie but there's actually stuff going on us filming so we Brought another crew in to film ours, and that turned out to be a documentary, Spooked the Ghosts of Waverly Sanatorium. And Sci Fi Channel in America picked that up, and Sony released the uh, film. Oh. And that's where it really all started. And that actually was when I got my first paranormal experience right. um, in the death tunnel, you know? That's yeah, yeah, crazy. Yeah. yeah. I think they featured it on, um, and they featured it on Ghost Asylum and Ghost Adventures. I think those two programs are both visited Waverley if I remember rightly because I do remember seeing I know one of them at least featured it uh, yeah I'm not sure how much they really featured what really happened where in the sense of say our documentary really mm. went into oh yeah yeah the last souls and the patients and the doctors and you know what really makes a haunted story is the spirits mm. um, you know and not even so much as the investigation say the history behind it and then you actually really know where to point your cameras and mm. know what questions to ask and know what what research you you know you need to complete to call, you know create the closure that you're looking for yeah but um i'm not obviously a big fan of uh, ghost hunting shows mostly because um unless you're looking to be entertained they're not very real yeah and i know you know there's nothing scarier than the truth so i think you can stay there <laughs> and be scared I must admit, I like them for the history side because, with the, especially the American ones, they feature stuff that I've never heard of in the UK. So it gives me more places to learn about myself and do my own research into. But um, I do, I do find them interesting from that perspective. But yeah, there's some of it, I, as you say, I think you can, it, you don't need to be have things flying across the screen necessarily to be scared or unnerved by something. Um, I did see an interview with yourself and your brother you're twins aren't you you and yeah Philip you're twins yeah I saw an interview yeah. so I don't know which one of you it was was saying this <laughs> but you mentioned something that one of you mentioned something about growing up in Halifax you lived in quite a spooky place or something something you your house was near well, was we quite... lived on the... yeah we lived um down in by Holmes Road which is right next to Adrian's Wall right um the 
the Moors is in Aiden's Wall, so you Lovely. that's actually where my mom and uh, dad's ashes. Right. Uh, so they they overlook Aiden's Wall, which is truly incredible. You know that wall still yeah. standing yeah. or being hand built. But um, yeah, I think we grew up. At, we were born in a in a uh, a, a haunted hospital, Halifax right. General. Right. You know, it was even uh, I've got baby pictures because we were born on um, uh, uh, Prince Andrew's birthday. We were All born right. on the day we were born, so we hit the papers the minute we were born. <laughs> and um, I think the nurse is is haunted. That's holding us in the newspaper. Actually, she's pretty scary looking. <laughs> <laughs> so it goes it goes back to you, you. You were destined to look into the paranormal then, really. I, I, I think we were destined to look into um, the sur- surreality, the yeah. surreal. Yeah. I think that's what it more is because we ended up making, you know, horror movies before we made paranormal movies. And then yeah. when we were making horror movies, we were filming in abandoned hospitals and asylums. And, oh, nice. <laughs> and thought out that they were, you know, something was going on here. And that's intriguing. Yeah. It really intriguing I mean yeah. once you experience a paranormal experience you can't go back no I mean, you can't not if you have a calling for spirituality and 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 you have this connection mm-hmm. which you're supposed to have a connection when you when you um, experience a, a, a spectral ex- mm-hmm. uh, visitor it's uh, they kind of let you see them because they believe in you and yep. and hopefully you don't have any ulterior motives which they're quick to pick up yep. because then they'll turn angry and you know you screw your life up or something. Yes. Well, I think there was again. I don't know whether it was you or your brother who said it, but it was a comment I thought was very good. And I'm probably paraphrasing it here, but it's basically saying don't rile the spirits. They've had a pretty there's a lot of them have had a pretty rough life. They don't need you giving them grief. And I am completely paraphrasing that, but. I that's kind of how I feel about it, you know. Be respectful, and they'll be respectful back normally. Um, but let's get on to the point of this call that you've you've kindly agreed to be interviewed for, the Cecil Hotel, Main Street, Los Angeles. Yeah. Um, you, you, I know that you've had experiences there. Um, what? Why was it you were in the hotel in the first place, Christopher? We were um, filming um, uh, a pilot for a reality show, mm-hmm. and um, the producers had wanted to do something else, and um, it had already been done as far as I was concerned. Um, I mean, I'm I'm, I'm a producer um, as well, so mm-hmm. I kind of thought what's going on. I, I didn't. I'm not into doing something that somebody's already touched. Mm-hmm. Nobody had really touched a the Cesar Hotel so um, and it's always intrigued me the story alone you know Mm. from the past to the the, even the present now Mm. so I said let's go do this story so you know obviously I started doing as much even more research and they started doing research and then we went down there and went into it and filmed it and tried to figure out what was going on so Mm -hmm. there you are so was it did it have residents in it at the time when you visited there I mean, I'm talking um, living, breathing, not... Speaking. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, you know, it's funny because um, it has a beautiful... I mean, you walk in and, of course, they've changed the name because they don't want people to know the sordid past. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, the the bloody sign is still on the side saying the oh, Cecil Hotel. <laughs> Even though it could say on Main at the front, it's still written, painted on the side of the hotel. Oh, that big but, 1920s um, sort of um, sign. Yeah, that was, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's still there, and um, you walk in, and there's nowhere to park, of course, but you walk in, and it's beautiful. It's got marble mm. floors and big columns, gold columns, and you feel like you're walking into some kind of French pavilion, you know, maybe Spanish resort of sorts, you know, mm-hmm. and um, then you walk up to the little, you know, the... Res- the uh, reservation counter, and then you first thing you notice is the infamous elevator on the mm. left. Yeah, that you know is it, you know we can talk. I'm sure we'll get to that. But we will anyway, get to that, that one. Yes, <laughs> uh, but um, it was just very trippy, and uh, we needed to get in there quick and get as much as we could. Mm-hmm. You know, 
it does certainly the foot the things I've seen the pictures I've seen of inside it and outside it does it does look like a absolutely stunning building and as I said sort of in the first half of the presentation I think if it didn't have such a dark history it would probably would be seen more as a historical sort of you know it would be seen as somewhere that people want yeah. to go as a historical thing as opposed to for some people uh not not everyone but some people quite uh, almost nefarious reasons they want to go there so when you were filming there um what what were your thoughts on the place as to what kind of vibe it had um well i mean the again the the first of all it's a very popular place and, mm -hmm. and it's a it's a hostel Mm -hmm. You know, so meaning not all rooms have bathrooms, which you know, obviously, the Europeans are very familiar with that. Where in America, you want, <laughs> but uh, but um, people drop literally. I think some of the cheapest rooms there at that time. I mean, our room cost one hundred and fifty dollars. Yeah, and and it was a piece of you know horrible hotel little you know. Um, Jail, a jail mattress with a right. sink in the corner, and the toilet was in the shower. Okay. The toilet actually was in the shower, like some hostels are. So you get off the toilet and you turn the shower on, so the right. toilet gets wet. Yeah. You know, it's just all combined. And when the other ones don't even have bathrooms, but the place was packed mm -hmm. with um, students mm -hmm. and um, hookers, a lot of hookers there, prostitutes, yeah. okay. and um, and very strange people. I yeah. mean, very strange people walking around, um, very eccentric-looking people. And, um, you know, then, because then your next step is to get into the elevator mm -hmm. and go up and mm -hmm. check out the floors. Mm -hmm. So, from the elevator, let's let's lead us into the infamous, I think one of probably the most infamous cases, which happened in 2013, was the very sad Eliza Lamb story where you know she was found I think it was two and a half weeks she was missing for and then she was found in the water tanks on the roof um, when people complained about the water tasting funny and um, <laughs> the, the water pressure being down I'm, I'm, I mentioned in my first half that I'm, I'm not sure what happened there because there's, there's things that to me that just don't add up um, I know I think the police ended up just found it as accidental death they don't think there was anything um, not suspicious, but an accidental death. There's a lot of questions as to how did she get onto the roof in the first place when the door's meant to be alarmed, and none of the staff said they heard the alarm go off. Um, but the the most interesting piece of evidence, I think, is as we talked about the elevator, is the the lift footage, the the footage, the camera in the lift. I think it's about three and a half minutes long, if my memory serves me correct. Um. Now she does look quite agitated in that footage, and get it, she she does to me look like she's looking at someone. She's hiding. She's trying to get away. Um, what are your thoughts on the whole Eliza Lamb well, thing? It's um you know first of all, I mean doing all the films I've done and the research on possession mm -hmm. uh, compared versus mental illness. Mm -hmm. There's a fine line between that because. Mm -hmm. You know, one can say I'm possessed, and you can say, "Well, you're just mentally ill." And then one says, "Well, people that are mentally ill are more um, open to be get possessed and yeah. to be controlled." So again, like that's a fine line. I mean, whether you're truly mentally ill or you're mentally or you're possessed or you're you know you were mentally ill and then you become possessed because your your immune system is down and you open up to all kind of hitchhikers. Mm -hmm. But um, looking at the footage. That I that I had seen, obviously missing um, a little piece in the middle. I don't know why it jumps like that because mm -hmm. you know it's like somebody cut it out. But go, we uh, Philip and I went into the real elevator, and um, you know we filmed inside the elevator, and we and we looked at the camera, filming us that we were filming that. And it, of course, it, I don't think it worked. Otherwise, they would have probably thrown us out because we had cameras. <laughs> but um, it was funny because just going, uh, I mean, I, I used a cell phone, a very uh, 4K high-end cell phone in my pocket, mm -hmm. and it, uh, it recorded the, the, the girl at the desk, and I, the first thing I said is, so, any famous people stay here? <laughs> and she goes, oh, yeah, this is a famous people stay here. Richard Ramirez stayed here. <laughs> went, well, he's not really a 
celebrity of sorts. Yeah, you wouldn't really want to recommend staying in the same room that the Night Stalker stayed in, I don't think. Please give me his room, okay? I'd love to stay in his room. I'm sure there are people, though, who would. There probably are people who would want to stay in it, but I don't think that's a name I would. Then we mentored Eliza Lamb, and she went... uh, um, I don't know what you're talking about. We don't want to talk about it. So I, we kind of laid off because, um, you know, at that point they would have asked you to leave because they knew why you were there. Mm-hmm. They don't want anything to do with that at all. They really don't. They spent a lot of money rebranding and trying to get away from that. Yeah. But I'd seen some YouTube videos of some um, amateur uh, indie filmmakers or whatever going in there, filming the hallways, doing all that, you know, filming everything in the room, staying overnight. That intrigued me, so I knew that we had to do that. Mm-hmm. So going in that elevator, one will first will notice, um, I believe it's missing a 13th floor, which is obviously the old days of superstition. Mm. But when you look at when she's, I don't know, if in your research, I'm sure you figured out, the rhythm that she pushes the buttons to try to get the door to close or the floor she needs to go on. Mm-hmm. And um, that was very interesting. And then, of course, of her um, looking like she saw somebody outside, yeah. then disappearing for, you know, um, whatever, 20, 30 seconds, and then coming back in and then even being more frantic, like, I got to get out of here, like mm. somebody was following her. Mm. So my feeling on it was, um, of course, they tried to, you know, they really pushed the fact that she wasn't taking, she was on meds mm-hmm. for schizophrenia. I believe it was or something like that or bipolar bipolar disorder yeah, yeah bipolar. Um, so she had missed her meds that day but for some reason none of this added up to me neither and I had the suspicion and my feeling was that possibly somebody had um, drugged her tried to take advantage of a, of a young hostile I mean a hostile not hostile but a hostile person that comes to a hostile to stay mm-hmm. Like a it's backpacker very, type, younger backpacking. Yeah, sort of, yeah, yeah, very territorial, like a, you know the movie Hostel, actually. Yeah. Very territorial with the predators, or even possibly a couple of chaps that worked there that did this more than once. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, and it, and um, the research that I did in the police reports that I saw, they had questioned quite a few people. Mm in the disappearance of her and possibly somebody that had done this before um, the laundry cart was used to possibly take the body to the top the alarm didn't need to go off if the person that worked there could turn it off when we were there we went onto the roof and the alarm Mm -hmm. didn't even ring ah interesting so um, and it was really funny and what was really trippy is I mean, there's so much, you know, to really go in, but when you're walking down the hallways, the energy and the vibes, you start seeing these people, and the first thing you feel is these people seem like they're zombieized in the oh. sense of they're just spaced out, and they're just walking. There was an old lady who was wearing just her slippers and hair curlers mm. walking down the hallway, you know, and, you, and then all these, you know, these, these prostitutes, and you're going like, how could they even afford... To bring up a John, you know, a, you know, a, mm-hmm. to pay because they were very expensive, and it was just very weird. The whole thing was very weird, and of course, the room we stayed in, they had no air conditioning at all, right. none. The beds were, and I have pictures, and I got, I'll share them with you. Thank you. Of me in the in the room, sitting down, trying to obviously channel what happened there and figure it out. And what I did notice when you get up to the top floor that you couldn't get to the roof. But what they did, what was really crazy, is they've had, I believe, six suicides there, Mm -hmm. a lot of jumpers, including one that hit the sign and then hit a pedestrian on his way down too. Yeah, it was was her. It it was Pauline Otten had had a row with her her husband back in 1962, I think it was. Yeah, and she jumped and she took out a pedestrian as she landed and killed them as well. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So... um, what I noticed after having quite a few jumpers and probably a lot of um, you know threats that they probably no one's even known about a lot of people saying they are jumping yep. but didn't make it they still don't have any bars in the windows oh, because it's a fire escape they could have windows that have alarms 
or you break in case of emergency. But mm -hmm. the windows are completely wide open. I mean, right. they were open and they were they are big enough to step right out onto the fire escape, which then you could get to the roof or you could jump from the fire escape. So mm -hmm. it was like even though all these suicides the windows still remain completely open. I mean, not just like where you would open them to get out in case of emergency. They were just mm. open. Yeah. So could you know, somebody have? Running. Could somebody strong? I mean, Eliza wasn't very big. Could somebody strong have carried her out the window and up that ladder to the roof? I think I, they could have, but it would have been much easier for someone to be pushing a laundry cart. Yeah, true. Yeah. The roof and turn the alarm off get rid of the body and make it look like she drowned herself mm. in, the, um, in the thing and then obviously possibly knowing any kind of drug effects that were in her system it would be worn off by the time they found it mm. I mean the first thing as crazy as I am and, and as, as thorough as I am as a documentarian the first thing I needed to do when I got there in my room was run the water and taste it mm -hmm. right? <laughs> <laughs> which I did do and um, maybe that explains what's happening today <laughs> you're a brave man you're a brave man <laughs> yeah, I, drank I think water. I'd have been taking bottled water if I went to that hotel somehow <laughs> And because um, I mean the concept obviously is that the water was icky and yeah. people started complaining the water was a dark colour and it was stopped up so they needed someone to check it out and they found this body that was deteriorating for two weeks or whatever inside the water system but I don't know in your research if you found the fact that her clothes were left outside neatly yep. of the water tank and the, the and lid so, of the water tank was pulled back across which was really hard to get someone I mean, in isn't it a 10 foot high tank so yeah. how she would have got in there and then tread I don't know how high the water levels were, but tread water to pull a lid back across. That is a bit to me that just really didn't make sense. The other bits, yes, maybe she could have had a psychotic break. Maybe someone had left the alarm off. You know, these things do happen. But it's how did she get in that tank and pull the lid back across? That, well, leaving that's, her clothes that, outside. That's the bit I don't get. You're leaving her clothes outside the tank just mm. looking from a detective type point of view is a clue to have someone to look into the tank if they didn't if the water didn't yeah. clog up there. because you're leaving clothes outside of a tank why not get rid of the clothes mm. obviously you know so either she you know they wanted the body to be found or you know sh she went on a skinny dip in the middle of the night inside a pool inside a water tank but even if she'd know, done so that how did she pull the lid back across well, exactly, and also it was really hot. The um, I believe the opening is 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 not very wide, so it's mm. really hard to get into it. It's only enough to pour water and clean the water, mm. so to speak. So it's just a very confusing issue, mm. and it was really blown off really quick too when they all found it and they shut it down really quickly. Like somebody paid them just to you know end this case. Yeah, yeah, and I, it, it my, is one that my, I think is yeah. I think the main reasons to have done this case and to continue this case is to get closure for Eliza Lamb herself and her family. And her family, that's exactly what I was going to say, yeah. We could get a call and say your daughter, you know, had an accident or she killed herself yeah. in this pool instead of finding out that somebody might have done it to her or, you know, and then, you know, this is obviously the big concept of a spiritual force that made her do it. And I have to tell you, and I, we were talking about before we got on to the show, I was mentioning yeah. that hotel has a draw. Mm -hmm. It's like it sucks the energy up. It's like a vamp. It's like American Horror Story, how they portrayed it. It's like it sucks the energy from all the youth because it's full of youth. Right. It's full of young people. They're going away on holiday having wild times. Yeah. So it's obviously, it's just perfect for vi like a vampire victim, so to speak. Yeah. It's like the queen of the damned you know uh, invitation and it's really sexy and it's full of wild parties and the hotel seems to feed off that yeah it has that energy when you walk in that it's ready for the next confused person or the next person that's down on their look it draws that kind of energy it sits on skid row mm -hmm. uh, which wasn't, didn't seem that bad to me but living in LA you kind of get used to it <laughs> to be that you know, we brought in our crew. We didn't seem to be that dangerous. So, 
you know, we had people wait in the vehicles, you know, because there were there were some you know, obviously seedy people around, but it seemed to draw in the, you know, I mean, it's like when I'm walking outside and I had a smoke outside, looking outside, and there was people that said, "Hey, did you, you know, do you know the story about what happened at this hotel?" And, and some some of them said no, and some of them said yes. That's why we're here. Yeah. You see, so it, it's. I think it's um, it's um, something we might find out more so when the next concept happens mm-hmm. um, you know that we had um, three psychics mm-hmm. um, look into what we were doing uh, though I never told them what case we were working on or what you know anything about the story nobody knew and we got three psychics all over the world and what I did is I sent them a picture of the elevator panel mm-hmm. where Eliza Lamb would have touched and the whole concept of that vibe inside the elevator is what I sent. I didn't, you know, send anything else and say, what do you see in this picture? And, it, and what intrigued me more than anything is everybody said the same thing. They said a triangle. They all said um, a triad, something in three. Right. They all said about three. Well, there was a concept that there was a possible situation. There were three people involved. There was um, two guys that took advantage of Eliza Lamb. Two people were questioned, including a busboy and uh, um, a serviceman, um, like the handyman. Yeah, yeah. They both said that they were Spanish. They had um, Spanish names. I found out those were the two people that were questioned. Wow. Uh, so you know, I obviously we didn't finish the case because um, the pilot didn't continue, and yeah. obviously to move on to another case. But I hadn't forgotten it, and I, I have every means to want to try to go back and wrap up what we're doing. I mean, mm-hmm. I'm actually looking at the pictures while we speak right now of and the film footage, which is on my desktop right now yeah. as we go through. It. It's creating the same shivers and the same energy vibe I had when I was when both Philip and I was there when we both went up. I remember when Philip and I before we walked in it, we turned to the camera crew and said, "Well, goodbye." Really, <laughs> this, it, it gave off that more, much of an aura. It did it does, and it does. It's it's you know, and, and we looked up in the hotel. It's really creepy. It's one of those hotels that are two parts, yeah. and the only way across from there is a fire escape because it's two. Buildings, yeah, and I think it's like I, you you know more than I do. There's like an incredible amount of rooms in that hotel. Yeah, I mean hundreds, right? And seven hundred, we suppose. Up, well, they're supposed to have been seven hundred when it was first built, but now they've reduced that down to six hundred. I think according to the research I did, but that's a lot of rooms. Yeah, that's yeah. a lot of rooms. That's an incredible amount of rooms, and um, they also. Um, I looked up and there was one light on, and it was red. You know, the room was red, so he gave. He already he also gave that kind of, you know, hotel hell devil feel yeah. that you, you know, you were looking for. Also, as a cinematographer, it's got you know a good vibe as well, but it's also a scary vibe. But to be honest with you, the energy in the hotel was just very waiting for its next victim, and that's why I was very impressed with the, the the you know the hotel Cortez in the American Horror yeah. Story because they were really dead on and. Ryan Murphy, the producer, was dead on with his research, which is American Horror has great research. Mm. They, re- you know, whether they're doing uh, Marie Laveau, you know, the Coven stuff, which mm-hmm. is, they do their research. They, yeah. you know, they definitely find out. Now, I think the outside of it was filmed actually at the uh, Cecil Hotel. Oh, okay. um, yeah, when they walk in, because I recognized my parking spot when we were. <laughs> So, but um, it's an incredible story, and it definitely has no closure. Well, I think one of the things that one of the other parallels with the Cortez and the Cecil, which um, I found quite interesting, is that one of the most recent deaths—I think it was 2015—that's meant to be attributed to the Cecil um, was there was a young guy found dead just outside the hotel. Literally, I think it was just outside the front of the hotel. And if you've watched American Horror Story Hotel. That's exactly what happens to Matt Bomer's character because he said he doesn't want to die in the hotel because if he dies in the hotel, he'll be trapped. So he wants to die just outside the front of the place. And right. I found that quite eerie, whether whether 
the the American Horror Story guys knew that story and that's why they put it in there. But yeah, you you, you know, I, I do wonder if Lady Gaga lives on the top floor at the <laughs> so if you go there there's like a hidden top well, floor that she lives she on. Can, yeah, you can bet she probably wanted to. I mean, that's the kind of energy it creates, but I have to tell you the I, I think the room that we stayed in, we st- we got two rooms. We basically tried to get in. They won't tell you what room Eliza Lamb rented mm-hmm. in the hotel. Um, um, we stayed on the fourth floor, and then we, we, as we understand, I believe it was, I think it was the fourth floor she stayed on in some of the research that we found out. Mm-hmm. So we stayed in what we would have believed would have been, you know, the most accurate we could have found out. But we noticed as we were leaving, the elevator kept going to the fourth floor, mm-hmm. no matter what. And there was nobody there. It kept opening up Weird. on the fourth floor. And then what was really one of the most creepiest things that happened is when Philip and I was on the top floor, which is the floor before the roof because she can't go on the roof except mm-hmm. by up some steps mm-hmm. and then by the um, fire escape is there was like a banging in the water tank uh, it was a really loud banging like somebody would bang on the pipes wow. it was really weird so what is, I got this on, on video so you can hear it but it was like what is that sound it sounds like of course we jumped to conclusions so it sounds like somebody's banging on the water water in the water tank but it sounded like a metal banging it was coming from the roof. Wow, and I'm getting shivers down it. my spine at that one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, see, for us, we are very lucky, and I, I want to use that word, very lucky and very blessed to, that it seems like the spirits interact a lot with us because we're trying to tell a unbiased way. You're trying to help. Yeah, we're trying to help, and we're coming yeah. from... You closure creates telling the story that they're trying to tell that they yep. couldn't tell, whether it's a lonely story, a death story, a rape story, whatever it may be. It's including without even death, creating of residual stains of being, you know, depressed, oppressed, being abused, and it stays in that room and it creates mm-hmm. this energy that when sensitive come in, they feel it and they've got yep. to clear that energy. They've got to tell the story to clear it. I mean, they got to find the murderer. They've got to let the people know that they can move on they found a mm-hmm. cure at Wayville Sanatorium you can move on now, you don't need to stay here anymore, yep. the cure is bound to the disease, you know, whatever it is, and the last thing you want to do is come in and call everybody a demon and mm-hmm. then you, you know the children go you calling an evil spirit and you're trying to provoke them and yeah. and it just becomes a mess and then of course that's when the satism starts with the mm-hmm. people breaking in and creating, oh I mean a haunted building, that's Let's put a satanic symbol up, you know, this is even cooler, mm-hmm. you know, and it creates this vortex of an energy. Yeah, no, I agree. You've got to be respectful. Be respectful. What they, yeah, I, I, I agree with everything you've said, Christopher. I do, I do. Um, well, I, I want to thank you ever so much for your time. Well, it's this afternoon in okay. where you are, isn't it? But tonight, where I am, um, I've I've learned an awful lot from talking to you. Um, I do really appreciate it, and um, my pleasure. Yeah, and I hope we get to talk again in the future because I think there's a lot of stories that you could tell that would benefit this channel. Well, let me let Thank me know. You. We've done everything from exorcisms to to uh, you know children ghost orphanages, which is very sad. I mean, yeah. trying to help child that you can't see is, is extremely heart wrenching. I'll bet. You can't I'll bet. you can't hold her. Yeah. You know, you can't hold, it, hold them and try to make everything all better. Yeah. So I mean it, but it's you know, it's uh if as long as you're trying to even if you don't get closure, you're working towards closure. Yeah. That's a step in the right direction. Yes. Not you're not hanging the trophy of what the word ghost hunter you know, yeah. really um, means where you're you're hanging a trophy. It's a trophy for you. It's not supposed to be a trophy for you. It's supposed to be that you're helping them. Yes, I agree. I agree. Well, thank you ever so much. I'm going to bring the interview to a close now. You've been absolutely brilliant. Um, so I would say thank you again to Mr. Christopher St. Booth. If you want to look at any of the things that he has filmed, or whatever, have a look at Spook TV. They're on YouTube. You can watch snippets of it on there and also at spooktv.com and spooktv.od was the on demand yeah, one that you can yeah, download spooktv. 
Yeah, spooktv-od.com is our yeah. streaming channel. Yeah. And also, Amazon, it's on Amazon yeah. Prime in the UK. You can find them in the Amazon Prime on the UK. And uh, we're pretty much everywhere. You can Google us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're just stalking us, aren't you? You're just stalking all of us people who want to watch that kind of stuff. Um, but thank you ever so much for your time, Christopher. And um, this has been Penny G. Morgan of Haunted Histories on Parasearch Radio UK thank you for listening there's only one more thing to say it's again thank you for listening good night and don't be scared of things that go bump in the night You're listening to Parasearch UK Radio. News, views and reviews from the world of the paranormal from across the UK and beyond. Find us on Facebook, Twitter and the World Wide Web. Parasearch UK Radio.